All right, so thank you all for coming to the second colloquium of our uh, online series. Uh, today, I am very happy to introduce Sarah Ellison of the University of Victoria, uh, who uh, got her PhD from a place that I am familiar with uh, in Cambridge, England, um, and uh, has been a professor in the University of Victoria uh, for a few years now, uh, is a Canada Research Chair and has won numerous awards, uh, and is going to tell us about the Clash of the Titans, galaxy mergers in the nearby universe. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm really delighted to be doing this today. It's somewhat ironic because at the beginning of this year, uh, in an attempt to reduce my professional carbon footprint, I actually committed to doing no work travel unless it was for at least a full week. And so this meant that I was sacrificing going to colloquia and doing you know, one, two day committee and board meetings um, for the sake of the environment. And then, you know, we find ourselves in this situation where uh, now this is the, the new normal. And so I like to be optimistic that this is giving us an opportunity to explore new ways to communicate within our uh, community that might be kinder to the environment in the long run. So hopefully that will turn out to be a silver lining for our current uh, suboptimal circumstances. So as Simeon said, I'm going to talk to you today about galaxy mergers, and I appreciate this is a, a diverse audience. And so the opening slide that I've had running here for the last few minutes is the picture that I would like for you to have in your minds when I'm talking about galaxy mergers. So this is a computer simulation um, of just two individual galaxies. So this is not a large cosmological simulation um, where the simulators have sent two galaxies on a collision course towards one another. And what you see is the effect of the gravitational disruption. So the tidal forces that are at play when these two galaxies have a close pass. And what you can see is that there is a very dramatic disturbance of the distribution of the, of the star but the same is also true of the gas and the dark matter in the galaxies. Um, and that eventually these galaxies are on this collision course such that they eventually coalesce and then they will settle down and reform into a, a smoother but much larger galaxy. And so this movie not only provides a good mental picture of what I'm going to be talking about, but it also emphasizes one of the main reasons that we're interested in, in galaxy mergers in astronomy, because it is one of the fundamental mechanisms through which mass grows in galaxies. We merge together the stellar component, we also merge the gas halos, the dark matter reservoirs, and also ultimately the supermassive black holes in the centers of the galaxies merge as well. But before I start uh, to dive into the, the physics of galaxy mergers, uh, I want to start with a quote. So, oh, hang on, why aren't my slides moving forward here? Uh, there we go. Um, so yes, I would like to start with this quote. So space is big. Space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts compared to space. So this, of course, is a quote by the late, great Douglas Adams from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the reason I like to share this quote is because you might be wondering why galaxy mergers ever happen. I mean, space is very big. The distances between galaxies are very large. And the universe is only getting bigger at an ever accelerating rate. And so it might seem at first blush somewhat surprising that galaxies ever have these close encounters in the first place. And so the first thing I want to do is to uh, sort of explain and contextualize why we expect galaxies to have these mergers in the first place. So we can do that by taking a look at a map of the distribution of galaxies in the nearby universe. So uh, in this figure, we have the data from a large galaxy survey where every individual point is the position of one galaxy. And then the color coding is showing the density of points at any location. So the way to read this map is that the distance from the center of the circle, so if you can see my cursor, so the distance from the center of the circle out towards the circumference is telling you the distance of that galaxy from us, so in uh, units of redshift here, and then reading around the circle, sort of as a methyl direction, this is telling us about the position of the galaxy 
on the night sky. And so what we can see from a map like this is that galaxies are not evenly distributed in space. They cluster together, they form this cosmic web where we have filaments of over densities of galaxies that are in rich environments and then we also have under dense void regions as well. And so this uneven distribution of galaxies is key to understanding why galaxies have close encounters because galaxies that are located in these very dense regions are in groups and in clusters and these carve out their own potential well so that even though the universe is expanding and the galaxies are being uh, drawn along for the ride in that overall cosmic expansion if a galaxy is in a um, its own potential along with other galaxies in a cluster it will move within that local potential so this is a movie, another computer simulation that illustrates how that process works. And so what you can see is individual galaxies moving around within their own cluster or group potential and having close encounters. And if the dynamics are conducive, then you can actually have these bound interactions and a merger can occur. This is why broadly we believe that galaxy mergers uh, can happen in the in the universe. But what observational evidence do we have that this is actually happening? Well, first of all, and maybe most convincing of, of all, we can take pictures such as this one. So this is a, a real observational image of a galaxy uh, with a companion caught in the act of interacting. So this is somewhat like a freeze frame picture from the, the simulation that I showed you on the very first slide. So we have two individual galaxies here that have had uh, a first close passage and we see these long streams of material that have been pulled off in these tidal interactions. So we can, we can take pictures like this of galaxies that are actually in the process of, uh, of interacting. But what about the prediction that essentially we're building up all galaxies through consecutive mergers over cosmic time, building up our dwarf galaxies all the way to uh, massive entities like our own Milky Way? Do we have evidence for that as well? Well, we do because we can take images of galaxies that look apparently normal, such as this one, which is the Andromeda galaxy, which is a, a spiral galaxy very similar to our own Milky Way, we believe, that's also located quite close to us. It's in our own local group. Um, and when we look at it in uh, an image such as this, it looks uh, relatively quiescent in the sense that it doesn't have these strong tidal features of a recent interaction. But when we take a very deep, very sensitive, low surface brightness image, we see quite quite a different story. So this is another image of Andromeda, but it's taken from a zoomed out perspective. So the picture that I showed you in the previous slide would sit just inside this green rectangle in the center. And with this much deeper image that's in the black and white, so this is a, a negative image now, such that the bright stars show up in black and the empty black sky shows up in white. What we can see in this very sensitive image is again evidence for these long tidal streams and shells. So this is uh, the fossil record of past interactions, accretion of smaller galaxies that have been tidally disrupted and left behind these faint stellar trails. And some galaxies, when you take these very deep images of them, look really spectacular. So this is a, a, an image of a galaxy that when you just take a normal depth image, looks very normal and, and boring. But again, with a low surface brightness image, you see these beautiful, dramatic shells uh, and streams and tidal features. So this is actually a very common feature of galaxies once we start to look deep enough. It seems that these merger signatures are very common. And we can even see evidence for this in our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, we're hampered in studying our own Milky Way galaxy because we're embedded deeply within it. So it's difficult to take those same kinds of low surface brightness images that we can for external galaxies. But we can um, untangle the history of past merges in a different way. And so this image is a superposition of uh, an optical image of our Milky Way galaxy. So our Milky Way galaxy is a disk galaxy. So this is us looking out through the plane of the galaxy. 
and then superimposed these colored points are showing the positions of individual streams of halo stars that have been identified by an ESA satellite called Gaia. So Gaia is mapping the positions and the velocities of a large number of stars in the outer halo of the Milky Way. And it's been able to identify these coherent uh, these coherent streams that are color coded here just for, for visual purposes. And so again, these are the remnants of interactions with smaller galaxies that have been tidally disrupted as they enter our Milky Way halo. So there's really an abundance of evidence, not only that the simulations predict that mergers should happen, but also observational evidence that they do happen. So now what we'd like to be able to do is understand what the merger process does to the galaxy. So in the simulations I've already shown you, we see this dramatic redistribution of the stellar material, but also the gas is disturbed, the dark matter is disturbed. So what does this do to the characteristics of the, of the galaxy? So we'll start off with asking simulations. And so we can use galaxy simulations in Two, that come in two different flavors in order to make predictions about what a merger or an interaction will do to a galaxy. So the first type of simulation we can use is very similar to the one that I showed you on the opening slide. We call this an idealized simulation or sometimes just a binary merger simulation. And the idea here is that uh, in our computer simulation box, we just take two galaxies and we choose the orbits that we want to uh, place them on and let gravity and hydrodynamics uh, do its thing. And so this is isolated from the, you know, the full context of the, of the universe, but it has several advantages. So the first advantage is that this is computationally very cheap to run. Uh, the second advantage is that we can run these at fairly high resolution, still with uh, somewhat modest resources. But it also has the experimental advantage that we can pick exactly the orbits that we want to put these galaxies on and exactly what we want the galaxies to look like. So if I want to have two elliptical galaxies with a certain mass ratio on a certain orbit, I can set all of that up in my initial conditions. But these very advantages can actually be disadvantages as well. And so we complement these idealized simulations with what we call cosmological simulations. So in a cosmological simulation, you have a much larger volume. So you sacrifice resolution. Uh, these are much more computationally expensive. Um, but the advantage here is that you have set up the universe with the initial conditions that we believe are correct. And then you just sort of wait and let the simulation evolve for a few billions of years. Sorry, was there a question? Okay, sorry, I thought I, thought I heard someone ask a question. Um, and so the uh, advantage with using cosmological simulations is that we can have the full gamut of diversity in terms of galaxy properties and dynamical properties in order to, uh, in order to investigate what the galaxy mergers do. And just to give you uh, some indication of the kind of outputs from these simulations, this is a small mosaic of galaxy mergers that are uh, identified in one of these large cosmological simulations. Uh, this is a paper that we published earlier this year in which we used uh, this illustrious TNG simulation and we tried to identify mergers in exactly the same way that I'm gonna to describe to you that we do in the survey. So I just show you this image to, um, to demonstrate that the galaxies that we select from these cosmological simulations look a lot like the ones that, that we see in, uh, in real images. So these are, these are the theoretical tools of the trade, the, uh, the idealized merger simulations and the cosmological simulations as well. And so we can use these simulations then to predict what changes we expect to see in, uh, in, in real mergers in the, uh, in the actual observable universe. So there have been, there's been a whole industry over the decades investigating the properties of galaxies that are in mergers. And broadly, there is a consensus as to, uh, as to what the outcomes are. So this is a nice schematic that encapsulates 
the, the life cycle of galaxies from these merger simulations. So the way to read this is to uh, start down here in the lower left and then to read our way around clockwise. Um, and then in the center here, there are two quantitative panels that are measuring certain properties of the, of the galaxy. So if we start down here in the lower left, so a, a galaxy before it's in any kind of interaction is in a nice smooth morphological uh, state. So in this case, uh, shown as a, as a disk galaxy. But then if it finds itself in some kind of group or cluster with mere neighbors, then it has the opportunity to have a close interaction. And so uh, here is the same image actually that I showed you uh, earlier. So this is a, a, a real pair of galaxies, not simulated galaxies. And the very first thing that we see is this uh, morphological disturbance where the shape of the galaxies is dramatically changed from the, the disk going in to these, uh, these tidal features being very, being very uh, dominant. So it's the stars that are the obvious thing here. That's what's producing the light in these optical images, but potentially even more important is what's happening in the gas. So once the stars are redistributed, they actually provide an opportunity for dramatic changes in the gas. And the reason is that once you generate uh, non-axisymmetric structures inside your galaxy, such as these tails and also internal bars that get generated, this is a mechanism through which the gas gets torqued. And when it gets torqued, it loses angular momentum. And so it flows towards the center. And so a key prediction of these simulations is that you should get gas flowing into the middle of the galaxy. Uh, and this is really crucial because once gas starts piling up in the galaxy, in the galaxy center, uh, several very dramatic changes can take place. The first is that you can have very uh, large bursts of new stars being formed. And that's what's shown in this upper panel here, this graph. So this is showing as a function of time during the merger, and these little letters here refer to the panels around the outside. What you can see is that uh, we're measuring here on the y-axis the uh, star formation rate. That's what this uh, stands for. Just, so just how many stars this galaxy in this particular simulation is forming. And so what we see is that the galaxy is just trucking along at a nice steady rate of star formation until it gets to this interaction stage here. And so once we start to disturb the galaxy, we get a boost in the star formation rate. And the reason for that is that this gas funneling towards the center is piling the gas up in the, in the middle. And there's a very simple connection in astrophysics between the surface density of the gas and how many stars you form. So when the gas gets funneled to the center, you increase the surface density of the gas in the, in the middle. And so your star formation rate has to go up. Another thing that can happen as a result of pouring all of this gas into the center is that you can actually send gas all the way down onto the central supermassive black hole that we think lurks in the center of essentially all massive galaxies. And so normally the black hole is sitting there quiescently minding its own business, but once you start to pour gas onto it, it forms an accretion disk, first of all. That accretion disk can light up across the electromagnetic spectrum and become very, very luminous. And then eventually the gas can also find its way all the way down onto the black hole. And the black hole is uh, now in this active accreting phase. Now, as a result of these two processes, so on the one hand, the big burst of star formation in the center, and on the other hand, this accretion and the lighting up of the, uh, of the black hole, these are two very energetic events. And so they feed back into the, uh, into the galaxy. And so another prediction then is that the feedback from the accretion and the starburst has the potential to remove or blow out, as we can see in this panel here, uh, the remaining gas in the galaxy. And that again is very crucial in the sense that this could then be one mechanism through which you remove gas from the galaxy. And if you remove the gas, you can't form any more stars. And so this is potentially one pathway through which the galaxy's star formation activity gets completely shut down. And so it ends up down here as a, a dead uh, elliptical galaxy that's no longer forming stars.
So this is the, the, the storyboard of the, the life cycle of a, of a galaxy merger that comes out of simulations. And so of course, if this is what the, uh, the theoreticians tell us to expect, as observers, we would like to go out and, uh, and test this. So how do we gather the data to empirically test these uh, simulation predictions? Well, the basic bread and butter of this work is large galaxy surveys. Now you need really large surveys to do this because mergers are intrinsically rare events. So in the present day universe, around 1% of galaxies are currently in some kind of active uh, interaction. And so we need large statistics in order to get a nice large sample in order to you know, test these predictions. And so, the bread and butter of the work that I've been engaged in for a number of years has been a particular survey uh, called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or the SDSS. And this has had a number of, uh, of incarnations, but at its heart, it is a large survey that contains both imaging, so taking pictures of the galaxies, but also spectroscopy. And in total, there are around a million galaxies that have uh, both been imaged and have spectra taken with them. And so this is the Sloan telescope here. It's a two and a half meter optical telescope that's located in New Mexico. And it has a few unique features that enable this very special survey. So one of them is it's got a fairly large field of view so that when it's taking its images, it can do so of a fairly large patch of the sky at a given time. But even more special is its ability to take many spectra in one shot. So if we would like to be able to compile a survey with a million spectra, we don't want to laboriously have to take one spectrum at a time, 20 minutes each for a million galaxies, this would be prohibitively long. Uh, and so the multiplexing ability of the, of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has been really key. And here in this picture, you can see how it's done. So what they do is after you've taken the image of a certain patch of sky, you can uh, identify what the positions of the individual galaxies are in that field. And then you take a large metal plate, which you can see under here, and you drill holes in the positions of the galaxies in the focal plane of the telescope. And then you can take these fiber optic cables and plug them into all of the holes. And in this way, you can take many hundreds of spectra in one shot. And so this makes uh, getting up to that target of a million galaxies a lot more feasible. So I just want to mention uh, briefly how we can measure certain astrophysical properties from these, uh, from these spectra. Because what we're doing is we're putting a single fiber on a single galaxy. So we're taking all of the light from a galaxy and we're going to try to derive its physical properties so that we can test how they're changed in the, in the presence of, a, of an interaction. And so just to remind you of your undergraduate um, optics, there are three basic types of, uh, three basic types of spectra. So we can have a continuous spectra. So if we have, for example, uh, a black body and stars behave rather like black bodies. And so we, uh, when we take the spectrum of a galaxy, which has got many, many stars in it of lots of different temperatures, and we superimpose all of these different black body curves, we get a continuum. And so down here we have the Sloan um, uh, spectrum of a, of a galaxy. And so as a function of wavelength, this continuum that you can see along here is the result of all of that starlight added together. Now, in addition, we can have an absorption spectrum. So if you have a cool gas cloud in front of your continuum source, then you get absorption lines that correspond to the electronic uh, transitions as the, um, uh, the photons of certain frequencies are absorbed according to what is inside this gas cloud. So this occurs in galaxies because we have cool gas in the, uh, the areas between the stars, the so-called interstellar medium. Um, but also because there are cooler atmospheres around the stars themselves. So we have absorption from these two different locations. And so again, if we look down to our spectrum here, you can see absorption lines in certain spots along here where that process is happening. 
And then finally, we have emission lines. And this is where you have a hot gas cloud where, of course, the electrons are then falling back down to their lower energy levels and giving out photons at characteristic wavelengths or frequencies. And this happens in galaxies because some gas clouds get heated by the presence of, uh, of hot stars, for example. Uh, and so you can see emission lines, again, in the spectrum here with that process. So this is what we get from Sloan, a million spectra like this. Um, how do we extract physical properties from these spectra? We're just going to give you a few examples. So for example, how we can measure the rate at which the galaxy is forming stars. This was one of the predictions, if you recall from the simulations, that a galaxy in an interaction is going to have a higher rate of star formation. So we need to have a way of measuring this star formation rate. And there are a few different ways to do this, but perhaps the simplest is to just measure the, uh, the strength, the flux in this uh, one emission line that is the Balmer alpha line. So this is where we have the electron moving between the second and the third energy levels. And this is a direct measure of the star formation rate because it is telling us about the number of electronic recombinations. And because the number of um, recombinations is directly reflecting the number of ionizing photons that are there in the first place, and these ionizing photons come from young hot stars, there's a direct conversion between the number of these newly formed hot stars and the number of these photons that are emitted. So this is a very simple way to figure out the star formation rate. Another thing that we're going to want to test is whether or not our black holes are accreting. Again, this is a prediction from this inflow of gas onto the central supermassive black hole. And again, we can use emission lines to test whether our black hole is accreting. And the reason that we can do this is because the strength of these different emission lines that have got different ionization potentials is going to be sensitive to the shape of the photoionization source. So if all we have in the galaxy is stars, that's a fairly soft radiation source. It's the you know, superposition of black bodies. In contrast, if we have a very hot accretion disk around our central supermassive black hole, that's something that's more like a power law, so a harder spectrum. And so we have different ratios of lines with different ionization potentials. So to show you exactly what that looks like, um, this is a plot in which every dot is an individual galaxy, it's just one galaxy, because we have one spectrum for every galaxy. And then we have different ratios of emission lines on the, uh, on the X and the Y axis. And what you can see is that the galaxies organize themselves into this V shape. And that's because the uh, galaxies that are experiencing just soft ionization from stars, they organize themselves on this left-hand wing. And once you start to crank up the more energetic end of the, of the photoionizing spectrum, as we expect from an accretion disk around a black hole, you get this harder radiation. And so the emission line ratios move onto this right-hand wing. So by identifying whether the galaxy is over here or over here, we can figure out whether or not the supermassive black hole is accreting. So that's how we're going to use uh, spectroscopic surveys to test these predictions of the, of the simulation. So now just a few words about the sample and how we're going to find the mergers that we're going to want to explore. So we do this in two parts. Uh, the first part is to find galaxies before they've actually merged together. So these are galaxy pairs. These are fairly easy to find in a spectroscopic survey because we have positions in terms of x, y on the sky. And from the spectrum, we also have the redshift or the distance. So we can do a fairly easy catalog search to find galaxies that are close on the sky and close in distance from the redshift. And therefore, we can infer that they're probably close together in space. 
And so we can go through the Sloan Digital Sky Survey catalogs and we can make a number of cuts. So we can require, for example, a certain physical, or sorry, a certain projected separation. So in the sample that I'm going to show you, um, we made a cut at 80 kiloparsecs. And so just to put this in context, because I appreciate that kiloparsecs are not exactly an everyday unit. Um, this is a schematic of our own local group of galaxies. So the Milky Way over here on the left. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy that I was mentioning earlier is almost 800 kiloparsecs away. And then uh, two of our nearest neighbor dwarf galaxies, the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud are about 50 kiloparsecs away. So, so we're looking in our survey within a fairly small uh, volume around the galaxies. So here is a mosaic of, uh, of some of these close pairs that we identify in the, in the Sloan. And you can see that these are very clearly interacting. You can see a lot of the same tidal features and morphological disturbances that, uh, that we've seen in earlier slides. And in total, we have about 14,000 galaxies and pairs that we can select in this way. Now, a really crucial part of our experiment is constructing a control sample because the experiments that we're going to want to do involve saying, how does property X in our mergers differ from the normal galaxy population? So in order to, to make this control sample, what we do is for every galaxy that's in a pair, we look at the many hundreds of thousands of galaxies that are not in a pair, and we make a bespoke control sample that is matched in properties that we think are, are relevant, such as mass, redshift, and environment. So this means that we typically have hundreds of control galaxies for every one in a pair. So we're going to be able to look at any given property differentially between our control sample and our merger sample. The second part of the merger selection is in the late stage of the interaction, once the two galaxies have fully coalesced together. This is predicted to be the regime in which the fireworks really get cranked up, where the starbursts are the biggest, where the accretion onto the black hole is the greatest. But finding these is much harder because we can't do this in the same kind of automated catalog search way that we can do for pairs. Now, these days, people are starting to work on machine learning algorithms, convolutional neural networks to try to, to do this work for us. Um, but when we compiled our sample, that, those techniques were very much in their, in their infancy. And so the way that we approached this was to harness the citizen science project called Galaxy Zoo. So this uh, was a project that was run a number of years ago where uh, volunteers around the world went through a tutorial of visual classifications and um, classified hundreds of thousands of galaxies in Sloan. And then statistics were compiled to, uh, to come up with a merger sample like this. So we have about a hundred of these galaxies that have been crowdsourced, identified through, through the Galaxy Zoom project. And then these have a control sample as well. All right, so now we're at the, the stage where we've understood the basic tools that we can use and we can actually now start to test whether these simulations actually got it right in the real universe. So we'll start off with this first prediction that the simulations made, which is that we should see that there is a tidal disruption and that the morphologies of the galaxies are changing. So I'm going to show you a number of figures that are set up in the same way. So I'm just going to take a moment to explain the way my axes are set up. So in all of the, the coming slides, we're going to see figures where we have projected separation on the x-axis. So you can basically read this as a timeline that goes from right to left. So the galaxies are getting closer and closer together uh, as we move towards the left side of the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, I'm going to show you a number of different properties. So in this case, it's the galaxy morphology. Um, and in all cases, I'm going to be showing the comparison of this given property between the mergers and the controls, because we're going to do this differential comparison. And so there, there's always this horizontal dashed line 
that shows us what we would expect if the mergers were behaving in exactly the same way as the control. So in this case, we're looking at some measure of asymmetry. So the way that we do this is we take the image of the galaxy, we rotate it 180 degrees, we subtract it from itself, and then we look at the distribution of the residual flux. And right. so we've- I'm sorry, could I interrupt just briefly? Yes, please do. Could you say a little bit more about how you constructed the control sample? So when you say you're matching galaxies in these different stages to mergers to other galaxies, what are you matching and how is that measured? Right, so for every galaxy that's in a merger, we look in the large pool of galaxies that are not mergers, and we take all of the galaxies from that control pool that are matched in stellar mass within some tolerance, uh, also matched in redshift and also matched in local environment. That's basically a nearest neighbor statistic. Uh, and so we match in those three properties because those are the main three properties that we believe are, that will otherwise regulate the properties that we're interested in. And so then for every, for every merger, we have, typically have hundreds of these matched controls so that we can take the ratio between the two of whatever property we're interested in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. It sounds like stellar mass is the key there. Stellar mass is the big one, yes. Yeah. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Uh, so what we're seeing here then is an asymmetry, or what we're measuring is an asymmetry excess. So what we can see is that when the galaxies are far apart, so remember this is in kiloparsecs, um, on average, galaxies and mergers are similarly asymmetric or similarly symmetric as the galaxies that are in the control sample. But as they get closer and closer together, we start to see that the mergers become uh, more and more asymmetric. Now, this is not particularly surprising because we know from just looking at images of galaxy mergers that they are asymmetric. But this is a nice way of quantifying that asymmetry uh, and also setting up uh, setting the scene for the other properties that are still to come. So the next property that we are interested in looking at is the star formation rate. So if you recall from the simulations, the prediction was that uh, we should get this boost in the star formation rate as the galaxies get close together. And then there's also this spike here, which uh, occurs at the time when the galaxies fully coalesce. That's where the biggest starburst is predicted to happen. So the same setup here for, for the plot, we have separation on the x-axis, but now I actually have an additional part of my plot here. It's this gray box. There's one data point in this gray box. Uh, so this point at negative separations, this is my post-merger sample. So I didn't show that on the previous slide for asymmetry because my post-mergers were selected visually to be asymmetric. So it's not really a very fair thing to do to show that they're really asymmetric. It's self-fulfilling. Um, but I can do it with the star formation rates. And so that's what I'm measuring here on the y-axis in this case is the ratio of the star formation rates in my merger sample relative to the star formation rates in my control sample. Um, and then this is actually a log plot. So in this case, the dashed line is along zero rather than the previous one that was a, that was a ratio. So what you can see is that uh, these, yes, question? Yeah, uh, I'm a little confused. Uh... How do you get this projected separation for your control sample? Because uh, you you are selecting galaxies which were close together for your for your your fourteen thousand uh, uh, galaxy pairs that you're looking at. But then, how do you do this for the control sample? Is it then they're they're just different uh, by redshift, so that they're not physically close; they're just angularly close, or or how do you do it? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and so I'll clarify. So uh, we allocate the projected separation to a control of the merger that it's matched to. So um, that's what I mean when I say I'm doing things differentially. So I can have, I can measure a star formation rate enhancement for every merger by comparing the staff, the average star formation rate of all of the controls to that merger. So now I have an enhancement for that galaxy. And so then all of the galaxies in each of these separation bins 
has an enhancement relative to their control. So there's no separation per se for the controls. It's just that the controls are matched to a pair that has a separation. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, that's a good clarification, thank you. So what we can see is that the star formation rates are enhanced in our sample, even out to the largest separations, even out to 80 kiloparsecs. Um, but we can see that the boost is gradually increasing as the galaxies get closer together, and that we have the largest boost in the post-mergers. So qualitatively, this is uh, exactly what the simulations predict. Uh, but recently, we've been able to go beyond just this sort of qualitative statement and actually make a quantitative comparison with cosmological simulations. So I alluded to this work earlier in my talk. Um, this is led by one of my colleagues, Dave Patton, where we took the illustrious TNG, or one of the illustrious TNG simulations, and identified galaxy pairs in exactly the same way that we've done with Sloan. Uh, so that we can do a direct head-to-head -head comparison. So the red line here is a very similar rendition to the data that I showed you in the, uh, the previous slide, although since we learned a number of years ago that the enhancement is still seen out to 80 kiloparsecs, this time we went out to much wider separations. So uh, the red line is the, the Sloan data, so the the observed mergers actually show star formation rate enhancements even out to 150 kiloparsecs. And then the blue is what we find in the simulations. And so there's really quite a, a remarkable agreement here uh, in the sense that we find both the qualitative result that we have an enhancement out to about the same projected separations, and it continues to increase as the galaxies get closer together. But quantitatively, the match is pretty good as well. And we've actually, in the paper that's, uh, that's now published, it's on, uh, on the archive, for those of you who are interested in looking at it, we did a number of investigations looking at different simulations. We also did it with Eagle. We did a number of resolution tests. Um, they don't all match as perfectly as this one. Um, so this is maybe somewhat of a, I shouldn't say fluke, but it maybe gives an overly optimistic impression of the, of the match, but all of the simulations do, do pretty well at matching the observations. And the nice thing with simulations is that we can actually run them forward in time. So with the observations, we just have a single snapshot. So when we identify a galaxy pair, we just have that one moment caught in time, whereas in the simulations, we can look at how the starburst evolves with time. So this is another paper in this series that we've been using with uh, the TNG simulation, this one led by one of my PhD students, Manhani. Um, so if you look at this lower left panel here, so this is the enhancement in the star formation rate in the pair phase that you've seen already. Um, so the star formation rate getting larger as we get to close separations. In this one, the projected separation axis is flipped. My apologies for that. Um, so this is going uh, to smaller and smaller separations. So we see the enhancement in the star formation rate. And then in this panel here is in the post-merger phase. And so you can see that we've got this large peak in the star formation rate, but it actually dies off fairly quickly. So within half a billion years, the starburst is, uh, is over. So even though that coalescence phase can be quite dramatic, giving us these starbursts, they don't contribute very much when you integrate over time, over the, the lifetime of the, of the galaxies. May I ask a, a quick question? Yes, please do. Um, if you were to run the simulation comparison with a simulation that didn't include AGM feedback or, or um, a supernova feedback, would you still get the right answer or is that very much off? Uh, so we did do some experiments of, uh, of exactly this. Uh, it depends certainly on the feedback prescriptions you have in the sense that if your, uh, your AGN feedback prescription is set up such that as soon as you pour the smallest amount of material onto the black hole, you have very strong feedback, then it's going to shut down the star formation very quickly. So I think that this, yes, will be sensitive to, to those to those kinds of prescriptions. Thanks. So speaking of AGN, uh, this is now going back to the observations to test this, uh, this prediction. So um, here in this panel here, this was the prediction for accretion rate onto the black hole. So you can see this somewhat mirrors 
what was happening with the star formation, that at the same time that star formation rates start to increase, so does the accretion onto the black hole. And likewise, we get this, uh, this strong peak in the accretion onto the black hole at late times when the, when the two galaxies are coalescing. And so recall that we can test this by classifying whether the galaxies in the Sloan survey are actively accreting onto their, onto their black holes by using this V-shaped diagram. So essentially what we do is in our galaxy sample of merges and controls, we ask ourselves, are they on the left wing, in which case they're star forming, or are they on the right wing, in which case the black holes are accreting. And then we can very simply just count up the number of galaxies that are AGN in the merger sample, or active galactic nuclei in the merger sample, the number that are uh, accreting in the control sample, take the ratio and see whether we get any more in the, in the mergers. And so that's what we're seeing here. Uh, and so again, as a function of the separation of our pairs, so galaxies getting closer together and then this post-merger point here, we can see that there is an excess of these accreting black holes and that that excess increases as the galaxies get closer and closer together and that it peaks in that late stage post-merger. So again, a qualitative reproduction of what the simulations have predicted. So at this point, the, the, the simulators are feeling, I think, probably fairly chuffed with themselves, right? They've made a number of these uh, predictions that have been borne out by the observations and not just qualitatively as well. I mean, some of these, such as the comparison with the TNG star formation rates, seem to be in fairly good quantitative agreement as well. So uh, this is good news. But there's one really critical comparison that we haven't yet made. And that is this blowout phase that is predicted to occur. And so Simeon already sort of alluded to this in terms of the way that the feedback is implemented, the way that the energy from the processes of starbursts and accretion is then coupled to the gas in the galaxy, which in many of these simulations predicts this very dramatic uh, removal of gas from the, from the galaxy and then a subsequent death of the, the star formation. Now, this is much harder to test because we can't measure the amount of gas in a galaxy from the Sloan survey itself. So those optical spectra that give us so many clues to the star formation and the black hole accretion, unfortunately, they don't tell us about the gas. To measure the gas, we need different observations, complementary new observations. And there are a few different ways that we can do this. We can either measure the atomic gas content in a galaxy. And so we uh, traditionally at low redshift, we do this using uh, emission from the 21 centimeter fine structure line. So the spin flip transition of, uh, of neutral hydrogen. And so we can make those measurements with radio telescopes such as Arecibo on the left here. Um, or we can measure the molecular gas content. And the way that this is traditionally done at low redshift is actually not to measure the molecular hydrogen directly, uh, but to measure a different molecule, which is CO. And then we can infer how much H2 there is from the, from the CO. So for this, we need a submillimeter telescope, uh, such as the IRAM 30 meter, which is shown here, or the, the JCMT. So what we now need to do is take these large samples of mergers that we've identified in Sloan and go and make measurements using these kinds of telescopes. So this is much uh, more laborious work in the sense that we have to, you know, one by one go and make these measurements. So now we're going to be working with much smaller samples. So our first attempt to do this um, was, uh, we published a few years ago, so this was led by a graduate student, Giulio Violino, where we selected just 11 uh, galaxies in close pairs from Sloan, and we used the IRAM 30 meter, which I showed you on the previous slide, to measure how much molecular gas there is in these galaxies. So here's just a, a little um, family portrait of some of the galaxies in our sample and the CO emission uh, that, that goes along with them. 
So again, we had a control sample for, for this, uh, which I won't speak about at, at too much length. Suffice to just say uh, that, this, uh, that our observations were done in exactly the same way as, uh, as the control sample that, that we used. And we were very careful to take care of systematics between the two so that we can then play the same kind of experimental game as we did with star formation rate, for example, in that we can look differentially at the molecular gas properties. So we can measure this difference in the molecular gas mass as the difference between the mass that we measure in these 11 pairs compared to the control sample that we've selected. Now, it would be hubris, I think, to now show you these results as a function of projected separation as I have in the past because I only have 11 galaxies, not you know, tens of thousands. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you a histogram, just a histogram of this offset property. And so the prediction is that if blowout happens, if we're removing the molecular gas, this number should be negative. I should have less gas in my merger than in my control. So here's the result. Uh, my 11 galaxies are in the red histogram. Um, so what you can see is that uh, not only do we not see negative values, there's actually a tendency for these paired galaxies, all 11 of them, uh, to show relatively high molecular gas masses compared to their controls, on average by a factor of two. So we don't see the signs of blowout, but we thought, well, maybe this is just a small sample. Uh, so maybe this is small number statistics uh, playing tricks on us. And so we need to do this with a larger sample. So we had uh, we then expanded our sample from 11 to almost 60 galaxies. So this is a combination of some archival observations as well as new data that we took ourselves. And so if you just focus on this histogram here. Uh, so this is a paper that was led by a postdoc, Xi'an Pan. Uh, the same metric that I showed you on the previous slide for those 11 pairs, now a sample of 60. And you can see that uh, this excess of molecular gas, so a, a systematic offset towards positive values of this uh, gas comparison is now very clear in this larger sample. So I think this is a very robust result now that galaxy pairs have not experienced a molecular gas blow out, they've actually got more on average than they started with. So that, that was a bit of a surprise. And so whilst scratching our heads about why this might be so, we thought, well, maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Okay, these gas inflows that we know happen, pile up gas in the middle, they actually make molecular gas. So maybe where we should be looking for the signature of blowout is in the atomic gas reservoir, which is also much more diffuse. So we went off to the telescope again, uh, to Arecibo this time, where we measured the atomic hydrogen gas content uh, for a sample of about 100 galaxies in the late stages of merging. And again, we had a control sample that we could compare to. So again, we could play the same game of comparing the gas fractions, so the atomic gas fractions this time in our mergers to those in the control. So again, if blowout is happening, this delta F gas should be negative. But again, it was not to be. We found that uh, far from seeing uh, low gas fractions in the, uh, the atomic hydrogen, on average, we find factors of two to three more atomic gas in, uh, in these late stage mergers. So uh, this blowout prediction is one, uh, one area where the simulations seem to have not got it quite right. So I'm almost out of time. I'm just going to spend two minutes on uh, telling you about future directions. So up until now, I've been telling you about integrated properties. So with the Sloan survey, we have a single fiber that we put on the galaxy to measure just a star formation rate, for example. Um, and likewise, with the gas measurements, we just have a single dish that we use to measure the total gas content of the galaxy. But we've now moved into the era of being able to spatially resolve 
these, uh, these properties. So for example, rather than taking a single fiber and putting it on the galaxy, the clever people at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey have now taken their fibers and bundled them together. So now they can take these entire fiber bundles and put them on top of the galaxy such that you don't just get one spectrum from the center, you get spectra all across the face of the galaxy. So now we can look at how the star formation changes across the, the, the face of the galaxy. And we also have ways to make maps of the gas so we can see where the gas is uh, accruing and where the star formation is reacting inside these post mergers. So, uh, for example, with observatories like ALMA, which is the large, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array on a high plateau in the north of Chile, we can get spatially resolved gas maps. And so, by combining together maps that we can get from bundles of optical spectra and spatially resolved gas maps that we can get with ALMA. We've recently um, launched this new survey that we call ALMAQUEST, the ALMA Manga Quenching and Star Formation Survey. Um, so these are three example galaxies. So each row here is one galaxy that we can map in uh, its stellar mass, in its star formation rate. So this is what we get from the optical, uh, the optical spectra. And then we can also map the gas, the molecular gas, on the same uh, spatial scales. And so by using these kinds of enhanced extra dimensional surveys, we're going to now start to be able to tease apart not just if these changes are happening, but exactly where in the galaxy these changes are happening as well. So I will leave you with my uh, summary. I won't read it out for you, but uh, I will uh, uh, maybe open the floor for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a very interesting uh, colloquium. Uh, who has a question for her? Okay, so I have a question. Ha <laughs> um, ha. I have a question. Oh no, Fred has a question. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, first of all, hi, Sarah. That was a great talk. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to see you. Just to see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually. Uh, I'll turn on my video, but I can't find it right now. Um, so my question is, so that bottom line result there in your summary um, is fascinating. Um, I think the thinking about feedback and blowouts maybe has evolved a little bit from that 2008 picture you were showing in the sense that people are, are thinking less about blowouts and maybe um, feedback operating um, by injecting kinetic energy and disrupting the interstellar medium and shutting down star formation that way without necessarily blowing the material completely out of the galaxy. Um, so I wonder that my question is, um, do you see evidence for that? Do you see in the post starburst or in the post uh, merger galaxies of evidence for disruption in the CO, for example? Do they have wider velocity dispersions? Yes, and that's what I think. So, and the second question is, is then that why would they have more gas? Right. This is a $64,000 question. Um, okay, so let me take the, the, the first one first. So uh, looking at the kinematics is something we haven't done yet, but something that is definitely on our to-do list. It's not something that's so easy to do with the Sloan spectra because the resolution is fairly crummy, um, but the ALMA resolution is around 10 kilometers a second, so, so we can definitely do that, but we haven't done it yet. Um, uh, and then in terms of why there is more, uh, more gas, let me see if I can just go... Oops. Have. Here we go. In one of my backup slides. Um, so I completely agree with you that uh, there has been evolution in the way that this feedback is 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 implemented. Um, and this was a paper that we published last year that was led by uh, Jorge Moreno, who is uh, not far from from you guys at Pomona College. Um, and so he was using one of these, you know, more. Uh, state of the art. I always feel like, you know, if you're a simulator, you always have to say state of the art before your, before your, before your simulation. Um, in, in the sense that it's, uh, it's very high resolution, it's a much more updated model. 
And so he was looking at exactly this question. Do you, you know, how are you affecting the, the interstellar medium? So uh, in these figures, he separated the ISM out into different phases and then tracked it again as a function of time. And we did that in uh, both the si a simulation with mergers and then one without. And so again, you can look relative to this black line um, in terms of the, the relation between the mergers and the control. And so he actually found that there, there is an excess of this uh, molecular gas phase and also a little bit in the atomic phase as well. So why it's happening, I think there are a few different possibilities. This, this simulation found the effect, but it didn't go yet to the next level to explain it. So there are a few different reasons. One could be that you have condensation in the, in the halo when the galaxies are, are interacting that you allow gas in the halo to cool. And so it replenishes the, the reservoir. Um, another could be that particularly for the molecular gas, these inflows that you know, pile the gas up in the center are again providing a mechanism to, um, to enhance that molecular gas reservoir. What we found in these simulations was it's the warm phase that seems to be depleted. So it seems to be this warm phase that's then um, you know, providing for the, for the cooler phases. Uh, I have a couple of questions. This is, this is George. Um, I'll see if I can formulate the first one. Um, in one of the first things you showed us is that merging galaxies tend to have increased star formation. Um, it, it seems like they would have to therefore have more gas and particularly more molecular gas. I mean, by the mechanisms you sort of described at the beginning of the talk. So, I mean, is, is it so surprising you're finding more gas? I mean, I, I know you're looking for the blowout mechanism, but it really, it would have been really weird to see more star formation and less gas. Right, so what I, what I didn't have the time to go into, but I'd refer you to this Violino paper, is that uh, we try to quantify this by looking at galaxies that had equally high uh, rates of star formation, but that weren't in mergers. Uh, so essentially also matching in star formation rate. Okay. And so when you do that, you still get a small excess of molecular gas, but it's, but it's greatly reduced for exactly the reasons that you say. Um, what's interesting is the star formation efficiencies are completely identical. So whether you have a starburst that's in a merger or a starburst that's happening for some other secular region, reason, uh, they seem to have the same efficiencies for, for converting their gas into stars. So yes, I, I agree with you that that uh, in the molecular gas, it's probably not super surprising. Um, the atomic gas, I would say, is a bit more of a surprise because that's not so causally linked to the current star formation rate. And you had a second question? I do. It's, it's, um, could you go back to your conclusion slide? And this is more speculative. Um, the, the AGN plot, is really nice. Um, I remember you showing me this when you were first working on it. It's a, it's a really beautiful plot. The star formation plot above it is also really nice, but it's noisier. Um, how, how can I ask this? So the, the AGN fraction you're taking from the position in the BPT diagram, right? How, how, is there any way in which the disturbance of gas that happens when, it, when in merging can produce the same, what does a galaxy look like if it merges but doesn't produce an AGN? Does it move in the BPT diagram? I guess what I'm asking is there, a, is there any way in which what you've taken and what everybody takes as an AGN signature could be mimicked by gas disturbance? Uh, and when you say disturbance, what's the physical process you have in mind, like shocks? Oh, I mean, the, just the, the stretching out of gas from the galaxy. I mean, the, the tails, and, and I mean, the galaxies are being stirred up. The gas is being, I would, I would imagine, therefore exposed to different stellar radiation fields than it otherwise would be. So you're saying, could a galaxy move on the BPT diagram for reasons other than AGN? Yeah, that's it. Right. Okay. Um, so... 
uh, there are a number of reasons that galaxies can move around on the BPT diagram that are not AGN, such as shocks, for example. So um, we tried to test that by changing where we put the, the cup, the, the, the BPT, and it always stayed the same. Uh, we've also done this experiment using different selection techniques for AGN that are not optical emission lines. So we've done it using mid-infrared colors, for example. We've done it using X-ray selection. So I didn't have time to show all of that. But in all of these different selection methods, the magnitude of the enhancement is different, but the presence of an enhancement is ubiquitous. So, so I think I feel fairly confident that that is happening. Um, what fraction of mergers have an AGN does seem to depend on how you, how you classify your AGN, which is, you know, maybe to be expected. Um, and, you know, what fraction of AGN are triggered by mergers? Well, probably not the majority, uh, but, but it, I, I, I think I would be willing to place a fairly significant wager on that mergers can trigger AGN because we see it in, in all of these diagnostics. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, but potentially, right. But it, it depends on the tracer in terms of degree. What, what is the, what is the range in, between tracers? What is the sort of min and max? Right. Yeah. So if you, if I were to put the mid infrared colors on this plot, the magnitude is much larger. So it goes up to a factor of about um, times 30 in the post mergers. If you look in the, in the mid infrared colors, for example, because in the mid infrared, you're very good at identifying obscured AGN, which are exactly the kind you expect in a merger because you're throwing all this, you know, gas and dust into the, into the center. And those can be invisible in the optical. So the mid infrared gives you a more complete census, I would say. So that's why you get an, an even stronger signature. Now, I will also say we've done the experiment the other way around, which is start off with an AGN sample and then look to see if they're mergers, right? So this, in this case, we started off with the mergers and looked to see if there's an excess of AGN. But we've also done it the other way around and we find exactly the same thing. There's about a factor of three more merges in an AGN sample than in a non-AGN sample. So kind of get, get the same answer both ways. Right. Uh, did Marie have a question? Yes. Hi, Professor Allison. Um, I'm Marie. Um, I think it's very interesting that to find that the post mergers actually have a higher molecular gas fraction. But I think we all think that the galaxies have to quench eventually, I suppose. So what types of galaxies should we go to look for the depletion in the molecular gas contents to just complete that evolution picture? Yeah, I don't think we found them yet in the sense that, um, so most of our post mergers are probably relatively recently merged. And we know that because we still see all of the tidal debris that should normally fade and, and settle down. Um, but even in uh, much later stage uh, interactions, such as post-starburst galaxies, which are often um, thought to be the, the later stages of, of mergers, these still have strong gas reservoirs. So at, at the moment, I would say the link between mergers and quenching is, is, is missing. Uh, I don't think we have any any observational evidence that that, that is, is happening. I see. At least not in a statistical sense. I mean, that's not to say that, you know, some individual galaxy might not quench. Um, and actually an, another follow-up that we're doing with the TNG simulations is finding this exact thing that uh, on the whole, when you track the galaxies post-merger, you always see more that are star forming than are quenched. But those that quench in mergers quench very fast. So if the feedback is sufficient, it seems to be somehow accelerated in the, in the mergers. But, but as I say, observationally, we have not found that connection. So if you, if you classify galaxies as quenched or not quenched, there's no excess in the, in the post-merger sample at all. And you mentioned that's AlmaQuest survey, and I guess you didn't have time to talk 
more about that. Um, so do you find the same results in those spatially resolved maps of different properties of galaxies? So we've completed the manga part of this. And so that was published last year by one of my graduate students, Mallory Thorpe. And so actually I think I have a figure from her here. So in fact, I may even have a better one. I'm just give one second. Yes, here we go. So these are manga profiles of star formation rate enhancements. So without the gas component. So she's measuring how much star formation she has in her merger samples, about 40 galaxies, as a function of radius. So each of these lines is how much excess or deficit star formation do you have relative to your expectation, uh, which is the dashed line, uh, in these mergers. And so what you can see is that most of these lines are large in the center. So most of them have got this central boost in the star formation rate but there's quite a diversity in the outer part of the disk some of them stay enhanced all the way out to one and a half effective radii uh, but some of them show a deficit of star formation in the outer disk so so we're starting to get results from the manga piece of this um, from the the alma piece of it we just got the uh, the merger sample of the alma quest survey uh, observed and delivered. So we've literally just got that CO data. So I don't have the CO data to show you on top of this yet. I see. Any, any more questions? All right, so you answered mine uh, right at the beginning with the fire simulation. So, okay, thank you very much, Sarah, again, for giving us a very fine colloquium. Um, normally we would clap, but this is kind of ridiculous over Zoom. So. Just uh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It was, uh, it was really a pleasure to join you. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope okay. you have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye. That's all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.